So, are you free? Maybe not as free as the propaganda would have you believe. I'm Chris. Let's talk about your freedom. So what does it mean to be free? There seem to be as many definitions as there are people who've tried to answer that question. I've got my own standards, and if you disagree, that's fine. Um, but I think my definitions are reasonable, pretty commonly accepted, and relevant to the kind of thing I talk about on this channel. Nowadays, people will often give you their answers in terms of specific freedoms. Yes, I have freedom of speech and freedom of association. It's written right here, because that's what they learned in school. This video is more about looking at the restrictions to your freedom. I think freedom means doing what you want without the threat of force to stop you. If there are restrictions on the things you want to do, you're not free. And conversely, when there are no restrictions, you can be free then. The threat of force might come from anyone who wants to take your freedom away. So it could be the police who take your freedom away according with the law, or someone else who threatens or attacks you for doing what you wanted to do, like a spouse who's abusing you. If a law isn't enforced, it doesn't matter as much, but if there's any chance the police will fine or jail you for violating it, it's a restriction on your freedom. In that sense, every law takes away your freedom. And when you consider how many thousands of laws there are, you realize how much effort has been put in to taking your freedom away. I've made a video on the law you might want to watch, where I look at some of the laws that control your body and your every action, these laws don't exist to defend your freedom, whatever you've been told. They're there to take it away. Let's define freedom further as the liberty to do things that don't cause other people suffering and take away their freedom. Sure, you're free, in a sense, to beat people up for no reason. But let's assume for this video, at least, that's not a legitimate freedom. Or, if nothing else, it's not a freedom most people would respect. And while most laws are restrictions on victimless activities and thereby restrictions on freedom, you could argue a law against beating people up for no reason is not a violation of one's freedom. Now, with this definition in mind, we could consider the question of whether it's okay to beat up a fascist. Surely, if there are some people marching down the street, chanting, gesturing, speaking on corners, and you stop them, you're taking away their freedom. But if we're talking about fascists, we're talking about people who necessarily want to take away other people's freedom. Their being able to march down the street shouting empowers them to do that. The whole M.O. of fascism is to oppress and kill anyone who isn't white, right-wing, cishet, able-bodied, and above the poverty line. So by my personal understanding of freedom, they shouldn't have the ability to just take over the streets and spread their bullshit around, because it causes other people's suffering, and necessarily impinges on their freedom. People who are under the threat of murder should not have to wait until their oppressors carry out their plans to defend themselves. Punching a Nazi is serving freedom. I just wanted to get that out of the way. But even if they're not trying to attack you, you still might not feel free around certain people. That's why we have what are known as safe spaces. I completely understand if people want a space to express themselves with no men around, or no white people or something. If I went to a space like that, my presence alone might make people feel threatened, making them less free to say and do what they want. So it's okay sometimes to exclude people who will take away your freedom. It's pretty much the same as a public smoking ban. 
people who didn't want to smoke secondhand can now go into bars and restaurants again. There's more than one kind of freedom. What I'm focusing on in this video can be called political freedom. Freedom from politically motivated violence. Which could mean by police or other state forces, but also violence from fascists and other bigots. But not all violence is political. We should be free from getting stabbed by strange people in the streets, too. But political violence is usually more predictable and harder to stop. Anyway, I think freedom from political violence is the most common definition of freedom, and the one most relevant to any discussion of politics. Before we look at whether or not we're free from political violence, however, I'd like to make a point about pressure. Many of us, or, or most of us, are under considerable pressure from other people to conform. And it can be just as stifling as a lack of political freedom. Even leaving aside pressure from the police to keep your nose clean when you're around them. Millions of people are under all kinds of pressures from family, their peers, their bosses. A lot of these pressures are from old ideas like religion and patriarchy that probably aren't in your interest. Unless you accept it and conform completely, giving up your freedom from the start, you get stressed. You get the incentive to lie. You feel guilty, frustrated, depressed, and you might take it out on other people. So as important as political freedom is, if we're putting pressure on other people to act the way we want them to, we might be ruining their lives. Again, freedom takes many forms, but if your mind is enslaved by someone else's ideas, you're never quite free. We could think of freedom as a matter of degree. Take cannabis. In a couple of places in the world, there are very few limits on how much you can grow or own or buy. In others, you can get the death penalty. In the middle, you have places where you can get cannabis or CBD or whatever legally, but maybe only with a doctor's note or a license. Or like in Canada, the sale of licenses to sell cannabis is super restricted, so the black market is alive and well. Some people seem to think as long as you can get something legally, you're free. But surely, if you have to ask for permission, they can deny you permission. So are you really free to do those things? How can you be free when you're forced into this unequal relationship, where an impersonal institution tells you what you are and are not allowed to do? It would be like saying a child was free. But at least most parents take care of their kids, have good intentions. Their well-being is tied up with that of the child. The state has an interest in taking away your power making you dependent and isolated, existing only to serve the owners of capital. And that's why there are so many restrictions on our freedom. Well, that's one reason. It's not just cannabis, it's everything. Our access to everything is restricted. For one thing, it costs money, which means it's not available if you don't have money. Are you free to have shelter, wear warm clothes, eat food, only if you can afford to. In that way, money is like permission to survive. Now that assumes the law is a restriction on one's freedom, because of course you could break into a building, maybe an unoccupied one, and stay there for no money. Or you could steal clothes or food. But of course, these things are illegal. And you know the police crack down on this kind of crime. The poorer you are, the more violence the state can get away with inflicting on you. It's legal to kick someone out of an empty building, even if it means they'll die of cold. But I don't know if that counts as a freedom, so much as a callous act sanctioned by a system that protects property rather than people. So our freedom is very restricted if we don't have money. But maybe we're free not to use money. Let's see. 
If you don't have money, you could go hunting or fishing, right? No, because you need a license. And because a lot of land is controlled by the state or corporations or private individuals with big estates, you can't hunt or fish there. So it's legal to take huge tracts of land, forcibly remove their indigenous inhabitants, turn it into a factory farm and pollute the surrounding waterways, but you're only allowed to have food for yourself if you have permission. So it's hard to become independent of the dominant economic system as well as the law. And it's not because of a politician's incompetence or a bureaucratic mistake. It's the result of centuries of policies that turn people from relatively independent families and communities into the consumers we are today. Laws were implemented in the US, UK, and elsewhere that strictly curbed or outlawed hunting, poaching, fishing, making your own clothes and shoes, claiming land to live on, growing food, building houses, and whatever other activities we might consider necessary. You can't cut hair without a license, which takes a long time to get. In some states in the U.S., it's illegal to collect rainwater on your own land. The state dismantled your freedom piece by piece for the purpose of turning us into wage laborers. Wage laborers depend on people with money to survive. So you're not free to do things if you don't have enough money. You're not free to be independent of the legal system, even though you never agreed to it. You're not free to be independent of the economy because you have to use money to buy food and clothes, pay rent, and pay taxes. To do the things you're supposedly allowed to do, you still have to ask for permission from the state which means filling out forms and paying fees that apparently your taxes didn't cover. What if I say, I hate this. I want to leave the country. Well, have you applied and paid and waited for a passport and a visa to the next place? You're not even free to leave. Shouldn't you have the, for the freedom not to participate in these systems of violence? Shouldn't we be allowed to opt out? Well, whatever your answer is, we aren't. Insofar as we're threatened with violence for refusing, we are not free. And even if you don't want to exercise those freedoms right now, think of the implications of not having them. No matter how oppressive and threatening a society is to an individual, it might be impossible for them to leave. Those people aren't free. They're trapped. We only have political freedom to the extent it's in the interests of people who have money and make laws. Freedom's not just at home or in the streets. We spend half or more of our waking time at work. So what's the situation like where you work? Do you have someone telling you what to do? Do you have the freedom to ignore them? Or are you obliged to follow them if you want to continue to earn money to survive? If they told you to work longer hours, would you have to? Because if you're working at a job that you wouldn't do if you didn't need it, so most jobs, you're not free for the time you're working. The more hours you work, the less freedom you have. What about freedom at work? Can you dress and act how you want? Who sets your hours? Can you work without a boss breathing down your neck? Do you ever have to work extra hard to meet quotas and standards? Are you expected to work overtime when the boss asks? What happens if you don't follow all their rules? These are all questions to ask yourself to see how free you really are. Then there's economic freedom. Economic freedom sounds like it should be on a level with political freedom, but we tend not to use it in the same way. The term usually refers to things like strong property rights and contract laws, or free trade, or how easy it is to start a business or set up a branch office in a given country. These are freedoms of a sort, 
but they're the kind of freedoms that concentrate wealth. So it's much easier for the rich to get richer and strengthen their power over everyone else. The idea that we call them economic freedoms is probably itself more of a creation of propaganda than of any real consideration of what freedom is. So for example, uh, you can look at the criteria of the Heritage Foundation. You can look them up if you like. But you can look at some of what they call freedoms. The rule of law. Well, we assume that the rule of law is bad, even though, as, as we've seen, laws are really there to take away your freedom. <clears throat> Government size, regulatory efficiency. In other words, the fewer regulations, the better. Open markets, free trade, investment freedom. It's right there. <laughs> You've also got the Fraser Institute, which is kind of the Canadian version. It's the other uh, conservative think tank, and it's kind of the same. Size of government, property rights, the rule of law, freedom to trade, not too many regulations, and so on. This way, a, a very narrow idea of economic freedom becomes the norm, the correct way an economy should be. Just getting a low rating, maybe because a country's trying to develop infant industries, makes us look down on those poor people in that country. That's why they're poor, not open enough to foreign investment, not strong enough rule of law. Foreign investment and the rule of law don't make wealth trickle down. It tends to make them get vacuumed up. They use these criteria not because they're proven to work in every case, after all, nothing in economics is like that, but because places like the US supposedly have these things, and they are supposedly the reason the country has done so well for itself. But the economic history of the US has millions of bodies in its wake. It has vast natural resources, which were and are taken with impunity from land which should belong to victims of genocide. A huge part of its economy was built on the back of enslaved Africans. The huge amount of wealth they created never trickled down to them. And then the U.S. saw the rise of big corporations, which in the past hundred years have taken over just about every good and service you can name hollowing out entire communities as they did so. You're free to compete with Walmart, but you'll lose. And that's a short answer as to why there are a handful of really, really rich people in the US and a couple of hundred million who can't even afford to get sick. To someone who doesn't have money, economic freedoms are just like lists of rights, always there for you on paper but meaningless in practice. You're free to get rich, but not everyone can get rich, as I've explained elsewhere. You're free to buy a $10 million dream home, but not if you don't have $10 million. Hierarchical institutions and hierarchical society ensure that a few people can exercise their freedoms however they want, but most of us don't have the option. So economic freedoms as we know them are not on the same level as political freedoms, despite what we've been told. Most people who think they're free tell me about specific rights delineated in constitutions governments are supposedly bound by. You need to look beyond words on paper. They say I have all kinds of rights and freedoms and as I've explained in another video, there's no reason to take them seriously. Unlike most laws, the state does not enforce your rights. It's, it's simply not bound by such documents. It takes what powers it can from the Constitution, but it doesn't have to do anything it says. That's how power works. They don't have to do things just because it's written that they do. Defending your freedom is not in the state's interest, unless you're rich. That's why it takes 
years of going through various courts and millions of dollars just to force the state to uphold the law against firing you for being gay, while it passes laws every day that it puts into practice immediately that all put legal limits on your freedom. To say a constitution or a state grants you freedom is to have everything backwards. Your freedom can only exist insofar as it isn't limited by the force of the state, or by others who want to use violence against you. And on that last note, you don't really need criminalizing burning a flag when you have unthinking nationalists to do it for you. Here. What if I yelled fire in a crowded theater? As an example from Oliver Wendell Holmes, U.S. Supreme Court judge in 1919, falsely yelling out fire in a crowded theater is an example of a reasonable limit on speech. And sometimes people use that example as a legitimate limit to one's freedom. But that wasn't what the case the Supreme Court was deciding at the time was about. It had nothing to do with theaters. They said that, based on this abstract example, it was punishable under the Espionage Act to distribute materials opposing the draft during World War I. In other words, they took away a major freedom, the freedom to dissent in public, by equating it to spreading panic by lying, when really they were spreading awareness by telling the truth. But see how easy it is for the state to limit your freedom. Pass a law, decided in the courts. Next thing you know, you're facing fines or jail time for something that didn't hurt anyone. Again, freedom is a matter of degrees, and some groups are less free than others, even within the same polity. So everyone is oppressed, but white people are less oppressed than black people. They're more likely to have money and less likely to face harassment and violence, whether from the police or from racists without badges. White people in Europe and North America are less oppressed than Arabs and Muslims, who are sub subjected to state surveillance and daily non-state harassment and violence. Able-bodied people are freer than disabled people, not only because they don't have to face the barriers to movement that a little money would solve, but also because disabled people are more likely to be the victims of stigma and violence. And this is what privilege means. You're still a victim of the system, you just suffer less than people who don't have the same privileges. One privilege I personally have, of, of millions by the way, is I have a family who accepts my decisions. This goes back to what I was saying about pressure. Not everyone has the freedom to ignore their family. But I still need to live somewhere. The wider culture puts all kinds of pressure on us to conform to norms and laws. So even if you're doing something harmless, your neighbors might still call the cops on you. I hear you have a problem with these gentlemen having a barbecue here at the lake. What's going on? Oh, now she don't want to talk. She doesn't want to talk now. Uh, it's illegal to have a charcoal grill in the park here. No, it's not, actually. I just yeah, looked at the it map. Is. It says this is a designated barbecue. People can call the cops on you for just about anything. So if you're around racists, it's illegal not to be white. And this kind of pressure shapes our choices. While you have the freedom to work for McDonald's, if we're really going to include that under freedom, you might also face a stigma, even if that's the only place you can find work. That stigma keeps fast food workers' wages down. 
as they're considered unskilled teenage burger flippers and so not worth more, despite the hard work they do. Less money and longer hours mean less freedom to do what you want. And stigma is okay as a cultural phenomenon, but that stigma should be on taking away people's freedom, whether by passing laws or pressuring people or attacking them or calling the cops on them, or keeping all the money so that the rest of us have less. But instead, those people who collude to keep you in bondage, politicians, bureaucrats, cops, bosses, and the wealthy, are praised as leaders who worked hard to provide jobs and security for the rest of us. Don't be fooled by their propaganda. They're the reason we're not free. What we lack in political freedom, we likewise tend to lack in mental freedom. The freedom to think for yourself, to consider your interests and those of the people you care about, rather than conforming to the laws and pressures and other ghosts that haunt our minds. Political and mental freedom are linked. People who are enslaved to a political and economic system have probably been exposed to propaganda all their lives, and are also psychologically dependent on that system. And if we free our bodies, say by escaping the plantation, we also need to free our minds, or we will long for the plantation, instead of setting out a new course for our lives. I don't want a free body and a mind trapped by propaganda just like I don't want to have a free mind and live in a physical cage. So, to recap, if you are subject to laws, pressure, bigotry, lack of money, or bad ideas, you might not be as free as you've been told. But there's good news. You can be. We can end oppressive institutions by working together. But it takes direct action not voting. It's been said by many who knew it had to be said that we're never truly free as long as others are in chains. If there are institutions and the mindset to dehumanize, enslave, oppress, and murder, they can come for you and me too. Truly believing in freedom means believing everyone should be free regardless of whether they have a job or if they filled out the right forms. So freedom is a lack of external constraints, threats and pressures, but it's also in our heads, in our thinking, and in our treatment with others. So with all this in mind, how would you design a free society if you could? Would it bear any resemblance to what we have today? Probably not. See you next week.